And another really dark uh, finding is uh, that a recent study of 21,000 women in 27 European countries found uh, consistently that women who were higher educated or earning more than their partners were much more likely to report all types of intimate partner violence. And from an evolutionary psychology Ooh. perspective, yeah, it's not, not good, right? Uh, you know, and uh, that's maybe an unintended consequence. And the way that works is if you're a man with a, a higher status mate who's spending a lot of her time around other high status males while you're away from her, that, that gives you a cue that you might be inclined to lose her and you actually might. Welcome to episode 159 of the Michaela Peterson podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson. This episode is everything you need to know about incels. In this episode, I spoke with William Costello about incels. You might be asking yourself why I decided to dedicate an entire episode to incels. Well, recently, William wrote the first academic paper discussing the psychology of incels, and he's incredibly well informed about the topic. And a few days ago, as you guys probably know, dad was dubbed king and god of the incels, thanks to actress Olivia Wilde. Olivia said the villain played by Chris Pine in her new movie, Don't Worry Darling, is based on my dad, who she described as a pseudo-intellectual hero to the incel community. So why not take this opportunity to learn a bit about what incels really are? Are they really evil right-wing misogynists? or something else entirely. William is also part of Dr. David Buss's Evolutionary Psychology Lab, which is really cool. In this episode, we discuss the characteristics of the average incel, the black pill worldview, hypergamy, mutual mate choice in men and women, socially enforced monogamy, and much more. This episode is brought to you by Better Fed Beef. If you've ever wondered how long a human can only eat lamb, literally nothing else, before they're really tired of eating lamb, well, I lasted two years, and now I am back to eating beef. Thank goodness, because I'm really tired of lamb. I love lamb, but like, I don't wanna eat lamb forever at this point. Better Fed Beef has ruined restaurants for me because they're so much better than eating out. And I I really don't like like aged meat, so eating out is tricky. Uh, So thank you, Better Fed, for that. They produce high quality beef from cattle raised by local farming partners in small town USA. Their beef's unbelievably tender. A study at North Dakota State University found that better fed beef is as tender as American Wagyu and at a fraction of the cost. Not exactly sure why that university was studying how tender beef is, but hey, maybe that's why universities are failing. At least now we know. Betterfed's farms are run by 17 different families across the Midwest who care for the cattle themselves. They raise all of their cattle following certified Anya standards, controlling for genetics, animal care, and raising practices. PhD ruminant nutritionists, you can literally get a PhD in anything. The podcast today is with a dude who specializes in incels. Anyway, these ruminant nutritionists have optimized the cow's diets to produce more high quality and healthy cattle. Better fed beef has the best tasting beef I've tried out of a box and just in general, and I've really tried all the beef that's available out of the box. Uh, They have tons of options like the backyard barbecue box, short ribs, ground beef, their low and slow box, brisket, etc. Everyone can get healthier and stronger if you add meat to your diet. My listeners can take a whopping 25% off their first order by going to betterfedbeef.com and using promo code MP at checkout. Their website is betterfedbeef.com. Their motto is real beef from real families. Try them out, 25% off, it's pretty big. MP, enjoy this episode. William Costello, welcome to my podcast. Thanks for having me on. Happy to be here. This should be this should be fun. Before we get started, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Okay, so um, last year in 2021, I graduated um, from Brunel University in London with a master's in psychology, culture and evolution. And my dissertation uh, focused on investigating the underlying psychology of incels or involuntary celibates. It was one of the first studies Uh, to include primary responses from self-identified incels. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm currently here in Austin, Texas, as a PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin, where I'm in David Buss's evolutionary psychology lab. And uh, yeah, that's uh, 
but my area of expertise so far is in cell psychology. So hopefully that will help with, with the conversation. That that should help with the conversation a lot. And you work with David Buss. That's fun. That's very cool. Uh, okay, so there's a bunch to cover, but we should probably first start off with what exactly is an incel? Right. So uh, incel stands for involuntary celibate, and it's uh, become kind of an online subculture of primarily men um, who kind of form their sense of identity around their perceived inability to form sexual or romantic relationships. They're involuntarily uh, celibate. Uh, a significant minority of incels are very um, misogynistic and online. Uh, they're very hostile online. Uh, but one study, not my own study, found that just 10% of incel accounts are responsible for the vast majority of online hostility. Mm. Um, and even more rare uh, amount of incels still actually lash out at society in violent rage. And there's some high profile cases where individual incels have even gone on to kill people. Most notorious is uh, perhaps Elliot Roger, uh, who wrote a 49 page manifesto talking about how he would have a day of retribution uh, where he would kill Chad's and Stacy's, who the, the sexually successful men and women uh, that he was envious of. Um, so he's kind of uh, held up as the prototypical example, poster boy, incel, uh, whenever the media reports on them. Uh, but even globally, worldwide, there's only ever been approximately 60 deaths attributable directly to incel violence. And I don't mean to demean um, any of the victims at all, but, but that's relatively low when incel violence is talked about as a new terrorist threat in the media sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we put that figure of 60 into more context, 10 of those alone can be accounted for by a guy called Alec Manazian. And he's the guy who drove his van into a crowd of people in Toronto. Yeah, uh, I remember that. That was right. scary. Yeah. Yeah. And he he's often held up as front and center as poster boy of the incel movement as well in the media. And um, because he had a, a Facebook post before he did what he did talking about how he wanted to start an incel rebellion and all hail the supreme gentleman, Elliot Roger. And, uh, you know, the, the beta uprising has begun. That that was his kind of rhetoric. Mm. But you don't often hear what's reported. Uh, what's less often reported is the judge's verdict in the case when they analyzed all the evidence. Uh, the judge said that basically uh, they considered that Alec Manazian was completely piggybacking on the incel movement uh, to ratchet up his own notoriety. Uh, he deliberately told lies to depict the killings as being connected to the incel movement to get more media attention. And his story to the police about the attack being an incel rebellion was a lie. So that's directly from the judge in the Alec Manazian case. Oh. You, you don't really hear that uh, talked about that often in the media. No. So was, mm -hmm. he, was he an incel or? Well, it, it, it's difficult to Breaks kind of out. know. He, he, he certainly seemed to use a lot of uh, incel kind of rhetoric in mm -hmm. that initial, that that post but that was the verdict of the judge uh, and, and the lawyers closest to the case interesting okay mm -hmm. so what made you decide to kind of base your education around this particular subject right so when i came to look into the topic uh, which i think is a very interesting one uh, because the incel uh, culture uh, for me kind of describes where our evolved mate preferences our evolutionary psychology meets cultural psychology and cultural kind of advances. Uh, so it was very interesting for me on that front. And also when I came to do my literature review uh, for the topic, I found that at the time almost no studies included mm -hmm. primary responses from incels themselves. All the studies were based on and analyzing the online misogyny or the online rhetoric of incels and uh, being quite familiar just in the online world of the incelosphere, I kind of had an inkling that a lot of what incels say online is deliberately antagonistic and just kind of performatively antagonistic, that they kind of say anything they feel will subvert the norm and will annoy people and just, you, you know, they're, they're very steeped in dark gallows humor meme culture and um, so you know it, it, it although analyzing the online misogyny is somewhat useful and um, I don't I, I don't I think you actually need to engage with the community uh, one to one or directly uh, to form any kind of psychological opinion uh, I'm also interested in incels because uh, 
this demographic of young men, traditionally in evolutionary psychology, we have something called young male syndrome. And basically young male syndrome is the consistent cross-cultural, cross-historical finding that in any population, when you have a surplus population of unpartnered young men, of sexless young men, uh, they cause a lot of crime and they disrupt society a lot. This is okay. due to that they usually have like elevated status seeking behaviors and risk taking. Uh, so it's actually quite dangerous. And uh, historically, there's been lots of kind of institutions developed to even deal with um, individual nations, surplus population of young men. So, for hmm. example, the Portuguese, uh, who when they maybe went sailing to discover new worlds, uh, th there are some theories that that was basically a, a device to cope with your surplus population of young men. You could just send them off on a mission. And uh, Vikings would be another example. We, we tend to think of Vikings as perhaps a very sexy, kind of rugged, maybe the Hollywood kind of Viking isn't probably really typical of what a Viking was like uh, in reality. They were more likely your surplus population of unmarried wow. young men. Yeah, there's a really cool article in the online magazine called uh, Unheard um, by Mary Harrington. Uh, she wrote an article talking about how incels could become the new Vikings. So, you know, we have a good lot of reason to worry about this population, this kind of surplus population of unpartnered young men who are galvanizing around this idea and seem to have a lot of resentment. But you would actually expect them to be a lot more disruptive than they actually currently are being. And, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that 60 deaths worldwide, 10 of which can be attributed to one man alone, who may or may not even have been that very much linked to the incel movement. So the idea behind why they're not more disruptive, uh, we maybe think that they might be having their status striving psychology mechanisms hijacked by online worlds, pornography, mm. the forums, just oh, um, shit posting online. Yeah, so it, there's a lot going on with this community. I think they're, and I, I also think that the mainstream media narrative about incels is very insufficient. And culturally, I think we kind of sneer at the incel problem a little bit. And uh, it's my opinion that the incel problem is just a symptom of what I would call a wider mating crisis that hurts everybody, not just disenfranchised young men. How large is this crisis? Like when I hear incel, I kind of think of like a very, very small part of the population. I don't think of that as a lot of people. And I hope it's not a lot of people because it is kind of sad and unfortunate. Uh, so how many people are we talking about here or what percentage of the population actually identify as incels? So it really depends on, uh, I sound a little bit like your father, <laughs> Jordan Peterson there saying it depends on what you mean. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it does depend on what you mean by incels. So uh, a smaller significant minority of the population, but we're talking less than 100,000, I would say, I would estimate. Um, and someone would probably correct me if I'm wrong there, would actually identify <laughs> online in the online subculture but then if you define incel as you know just a, a man who's struggling to to get sex those are rising mm -hmm. all the time and there's a figure that the share of u.s men younger than 30 reporting having no sex within the last year rose from eight percent in 2008 to 28 percent in 2018 and what 2018 so that's before covid right yeah so that was what? Uh, yeah. And actually, there's some evidence that that might be reversing a little bit, probably due to COVID, because men uh, would actually be like risk taking so that the, the percentage of men is kind of good. They would actually risk breaking COVID lockdown to have sex. But yeah, that's a that's kind of a, a worrying trend of sexlessness. But a figure to kind of put with that is that uh, it's not all men that are getting more sexless. Uh, there's a small minority of men at the top that are doing very well. So to put that into context, Compared to 2002, men overall had the same number of sex partners in 2013, but the top 20% of men had a 25% increase in sexual partners, and the top 5% of men had an even more dramatic 38% increase. So you can kind of see this skew happening, uh, whereby a lot of men are being left out, some men are being very, very successful. And it kind of maybe points that incels are maybe partially accurate uh, in their assessment of some aspects of the mating market, that there may be, well, uh, a handful of chads who are reluctant to commit um, long term, who are just um, really enjoying the short term mating market. Huh. 
Mm -hmm. um, okay, wow, that's really interesting. Why would there be that increase? Is that social media? Like, how are these like top market men getting so many more women than they were before? Well, I think that uh, there is like online dating apps give them kind of a device yeah, okay. to maybe access. Uh, you know, and, and without incurring the reputational costs of being a short term mater, you might have in our ancestral environment, certainly, or even just before online dating, you can kind of move city quite quickly or easily in an online dating app context. And um, there's also going to be a somewhat of a cultural drive towards singlehood. Um, you know, like even big companies are kind of maybe encouraging women in particular to kind of remain single. Um, mm -hmm. With Chris Williamson, we were talking about some, a recent article whereby it was highlighting how single women can earn a lot more money and, um, you know, they're doing a lot better than single men in their career. And it's kind of this maybe cultural drive to prioritize the male default of uh, CEO, boardroom, badass type feminism, that that's seen as priority over the uh, the kind of the polar opposite of the trad wife, uh, family oriented woman. It's it's kind of maybe an acknowledgement that the gender pay gap was never really real uh, in so far yeah. as it's more like a motherhood penalty. And that is where women do get punished is uh, women actually, and certainly in the UK, earn just as much or even more than men up until the age of 29, I believe. And then the motherhood penalty maybe kicks in. But it's only describing it as a penalty if you consider the woman's own income herself Married women, actually, their income would be more than the single women. Hmm. Okay, so looking at this from more female, a more female perspective, are women also suffering from this kind of sexlessness or is this mostly male focused? Uh, so I'm always asked whether uh, there's such a thing as a fem cell, a female incel. And uh, initially, I could, I maybe would have, I could only find nine female incels from my study, so I kind of okay. didn't focus on them. Yeah. Um, and incels would kind of say to you, "There's no such thing as a female incel because uh, most women, um, no matter how low mate value they might be, they could probably go out and get sex or a relationship yeah. if they wanted. They just might need to lower their standards." And initially, I kind of thought, yeah, that, that maybe makes intuitive sense. Yeah, that's probably true. And a lot of my female friends would probably agree with that. But uh, it, 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 I think that's a real failure of cross-sex mind reading on the behalf of incels, because they see that the woman's ability to get something rather than nothing, they always see that as better. Whereas mm -hmm. for a woman, getting the sex or relationship that you don't want is actually worse than nothing. It's cost inflicting. And I think incels really underestimate how much women don't want to have sex with men they don't want to have sex with. <laughs> that's, that's really bad <laughs> for women. Uh, so they'd rather stay yeah. single. And, you know, I, I think about my female friends and I wouldn't advise them to settle for a man that they didn't want or a relationship they didn't want. And it's kind of um, an artifact of maybe women's liberation into the workplace and their socioeconomic success that they don't have to perhaps settle for men that they don't want. And it might be a dark um, or a kind of uncomfortable truth for us to acknowledge that maybe for the last number of decades, women had been perhaps doing that out of strict uh, socially enforced monogamy, which is a phrase that your dad got in trouble for using. Yeah, we can um, talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, or um, just uh, out of strict economic necessity. So now women don't really need to, so they're not. But the, what, what happens then women's uh, interest then is aimed kind of hypergamously so that uh, women tend to mate across or up in status hierarchies and um you know if, if there's a, with any sex ratio if there's only a small amount of men that are in uh, women are interested in then they call the shots and uh, you know women kind of th those small minority of men that women are interested in are reluctant to commit to long-term mating because they're in the minority, they're the scarcity. So they're not, uh, they kind of create the rules of the, the, of the mating market, uh, so to speak. Now, there is some evidence that hypergamy, so women tendency to mate up in status hierarchies is declining a little bit in recent years. Really? And I think, I think that's inevitable with um, women's rapid uh, socioeconomic success. But even the authors of that study that showed that hypergamy is uh, in decline, uh, they commented that they couldn't speak to women's perceived difficulties in accessing the mate. Uh, so they said, oh, maybe women aren't actually that happy about it. 
And another really dark uh, finding is uh, that a recent study of 21,000 women in 27 European countries found uh, consistently that women who were higher educated or earning more than their partners were much more likely to report all types of intimate partner violence. And from an evolutionary psychology Ooh. perspective, yeah, it's not not good, right? Uh, you know, and uh, that's maybe an unintended consequence. And the way that works is if you're a man with a, a higher status mate who's spending a lot of her time around other high status males while you're away from her, that that gives you a cue that you might be inclined to lose her and you actually might. Um, so uh, some men choose the strategy of cost inflicting mate retention strategies. And that's what the violence is, the intimate partner violence. It's trying to in inflict so much cost on your partner that it makes it costly for them to leave. Uh, so their self-esteem is lowered. Their, um, yeah, they just think it would be too costly to actually leave. There's also some wow. evidence as well. Um, that, that's that, really interesting. That's really yeah. interesting. It's yeah. kind of like an unintended consequence because, you, you know, you tend to think of, you know, women's socioeconomic success as just a net good. Uh, and it has been for like um, economically and for, for like a country's GDP and things like that. But, you know, there's a, a maybe a bigger picture to think about. And you have capitalist capitalist giants like Morgan Stanley. They released a forecast called the rise of the she economy and predicting that 45 percent of working age women um, between the ages of 25 and 44 will be single and childless by the uh, by the year 2030. That's the largest share in recorded history, up from 41% in 2018. Uh, so you can see that their wow. capitalist giants are putting the foot to the floor on this she economy, badass feminism, because they get access to worker drones who will work 60-hour yeah. work weeks. And you might recall, Michaela, do you remember that uh, New Yorker um, cover it had a like a picture and maybe you can you can get it up on the screen in, in the edit it shows a woman kind of living in a kind of like a bachelor pad it's really messy kind of home office and she's in her flip-flops at the with a glass of wine at her laptop and uh, it's kind of talking like seeming to suggest that this is the vision women should strive for but, Oof. Uh, yeah it, it looked a bit bleak for me but I, i'm kind of libertarian in my sensibilities i kind of like the more more freedom the better yeah, um, yeah, me too. But but more, but I feel like stay at home mom or kind of that traditional kind of um, the role is a bit more demeaned uh, in the mainstream, certainly. Oh, one hundred percent, it's more demeaned. Mm -hmm. I think there's also like there's also a major issue with it that I think most countries aren't tackling with being a stay at home mom. It's like maybe one of the ways to encourage that is we lower taxes for people who have kids, right? I know. Um, I think it's Hungary. I think, mm. and I think people will correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think it's if if a woman has more than four kids, she doesn't pay income tax anymore. Yeah. And like those kind of incentives to kind of modernize staying at home. Otherwise, you do lose half your income. I mean, you gain kids, right? But yeah, it's a complicated issue. I'm also wondering if some of these women who don't end up getting into relationships because they don't like, like you said, you don't want, you really don't want to have sex with someone you don't want to have sex with. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't think uh, you probably know more about this, but I don't think women have the same urges either. Like, I don't, I don't think, I think you can go personally. I know, like I can go six or seven months, not have sex. And I don't really feel that much different than I did at the very beginning of that. Mm -hmm. Like there's, I'm like, okay, like there's not some sort of urge to go have sex that there wouldn't have been at the very beginning. I don't know if it differs for for incels or people who can't have sex, where it's like the longer it goes, the worse you feel. Yeah, uh, there's certainly a sex difference there in sexual psychology, and the 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 effect sizes of the differences between men and women in sexual psychology are some of the biggest in all of psychology. The there are the effect sizes that are basically like the equivalent of the differences between men and women in upper body strength. So it, that's wow. almost unheard of in psychology. Okay. So, so that's huge. But th those are average group differences, right? There's yeah. obviously individual differences between, you know, some women would be, have maybe more male typical sex drive. But yeah, the, the kind of desire for frequency of sex, variety of sex partners, number of sex partners is always generally much more uh, among men. And that makes sense. And your, your father kind of hinted at this um, when he said about women being choosy in his video. He talked about 
well, you'd be choosy too if you got pregnant or potentially might have got pre get pregnant every time you had sex. And if we think about like birth control is, uh, has just been developed in the blink of an eye over our evolutionary history. Uh, so our psychological uh, sex psychology mechanisms evolved in a world without any you know, uh, contraception and things like that, mm -hmm. where pregnancy and giving birth and uh, carrying a child was very, very dangerous and risky for, for a woman. Um, you know, a lot of um, mortality during childbirth, things like that. So, you know, it's, a, it's not really surprising that that biological difference between men and women, that greater parental investment, uh, you know, the, the, the most amount of offspring or children that a, a single woman has had is 69, right? And that sounds like a lot, right? That sounds like a lot for one single woman. But what? men, yeah, it's a, that, that, that's a really, an outlier, How is that, right? Was that like... It triplets was this, repeatedly for a what? number of triplets for sure but um, nine did you say 69 69 is the highest right but that's nothing compared to some men like genghis khan for example is reported to have thousands of offspring so you know for a woman she can only have a limited amount like 69 is a crazy like 69 extreme. Is the limit. you know that's what? like we recognize that's crazy extreme uh, but for a man theoretically there's no limit it, it, all it takes is one successful sex act which um, I'm reliably informed can take just as quick as three minutes. So, yeah. uh, but uh, that's not speaking from <laughs> personal experience. <laughs> but uh, yeah, theoretically, unlimited amount. Um, but, it, you know, the human male invests a lot more in their offspring uh, than vast majority of other mammals. It's, it's, um, uh, but, but nowhere near as much as the human female. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So throughout your studies, um, have you identified what the average incel looks like? Uh, so what are they I've, like? I ha my big study, my quantitative study, didn't uh, look at their looks at all. Uh, but I have interviewed some um, qualitatively in one-to-one -one interviews over Zoom. But I, but I wouldn't like to comment one way or the other what they look like. No, no, no. I mean, okay. I, I don't mean looks like exactly in that oh. way. I mean, like characteristics. Sure. Okay. My dad so, would have corrected me on that. He'd be like, that's a bad question. You posed a bad question. But yeah, characteristics of the average incel, because what you hear online is kind of what you said earlier, which is like violent, aggressive, women hating, dangerous. So what do they actually look like? Okay. So I can talk you through some of, some of the data uh, that I found. So one of the things we investigated was their levels of well being, because uh, men's sense of their own mate value is a direct proxy for self-esteem, right? You can actually track the two things, track each other very well. Uh, so we hypothesized that incels would have very low levels of well-being, and they did. They had um, higher levels of depression, anxiety, and loneliness, lower levels of satisfaction with life. But just to put that into context for you, just how bad the levels of well-being are, we used the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7, which are instruments to measure depression and anxiety that are used by the NHS in the UK uh, to clinically diagnose um, patients with depression and anxiety. So we found that roughly 73% of incels could be clinically diagnosed using that criteria as severely or moderately severely depressed versus 33% of non-incels. In terms of anxiety, uh, we found that roughly 67% of incels could be diagnosed as severely or moderately uh, anxious versus 38% uh, of non-incels. Um, we, we found that they scored higher on what's called sociosexual desire, which is um, basically like the desire to have um, uncommitted sex, so to short-term mating. So there are high levels of desire, and that uh, tracks a lot of data where uh, men who feel that they can't get, get sex in their behavior, their desire goes up. We also found that incels scored very high on a new personality construct called the tendency for interpersonal victimhood. And uh, that's kind Ooh. of uh, leads to like an external or, or an external locus of control, which means that you feel that your life and everything that happens to you is completely outside of your own control, that you can't control it. Um, the tendency for interpersonal victimhood is comprised of four different dimensions. So the first one is a need for recognition. So it's like a preoccupation with having the legitimacy of your grievance acknowledged. So for incels, I've noticed that one of the worst things you can say to them to make them feel bad is you don't look so bad or you, you don't have it so bad. You could get a girlfriend for sure. Yeah. They hate that. They want yeah. you to actually say, no, you know what? You're right. 
um, you, you have a real problem here. Uh, the second dimension is moral elitism. So the belief that the individual or their in-group behaves more morally uh, than others. And that you can kind of see that in incels whereby they maybe uh, poke, uh, they, they highlight how superficial the mating market is, how Stacy and Chad are kind of, you know, a bit superficial. And maybe, maybe they have a little bit of a point, but uh, incels might suggest that their um, mating preferences would be a little bit more uh, moral or intellectual. Uh, the third uh, uh, dimension is a lack of empathy. So the way this transpires is that because incels have been hurt in the past, they feel entitled to hurt others. So nobody cares about my feelings. Why should I care about anyone else's? Hmm. And the final one is rumination. Um, uh, so constantly a preoccupation with playing back perceived instances of rejection um, or uh, hurt over and over in your own head. And this idea of a tendency for interpersonal victimhood the external locus of control makes a lot of sense when you think about the incel black pill philosophy or the black pill worldview. Uh, so are you familiar with black pill? Yeah, let's do that. What is the black pill worldview? Sure. So the black pill is a derivative of the concept of the red pill from the movie The Matrix. And uh, the red pill denotes a kind of a willingness to see the world as it really is, as opposed to taking the blissful ignorance of the blue pill. Uh, the black pill then for incels refers to their belief that there is nothing and there was uh, never nothing that they could do to improve their romantic prospects. And it's kind of entered into just very online parlance now that people are black pilled on various type of things. And it describes yeah. just a kind of cynical attitude. Uh, but the black pill kind of worldview uh, kind of uh, captures uh, it would be one of the only things that I think a large swell of incels kind of agree on, you know, it's um, it's hard to get them to agree on a lot of things, but uh, they seem to agree on that one. Do you think this increase in um, sexless, sexlessness, and I guess to the incel community, is it possible that the community itself seems larger because they have access to these forums online? So it's like, oh, there's lots of people out there like me. Do you, is that possible? Yeah, I think so. And, uh, you know, given that just 10% of incel accounts, uh, the most extreme minority within the community, do most of the talking and shout yeah. the loudest. And they're the ones we tend to focus on, certainly in the media. Uh, so it maybe gives us the impression that there's far more incels uh, uh, who think like this. But yeah, the, the incel kind of, depending on how you define incel, it could be larger or smaller. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's certainly a possibility. But one thing I definitely think for incels is that we live in a, a kind of like a sex saturated world or we get the impression that yeah. we do anyway. So you walk through a city, you see billboards of really attractive men and women. Uh, you watch TV and there's amazing sex on every, every show because it sells. Uh, you know, uh, you get this kind of impression that everyone is having an amazing sex life. But actually, it's not true. People often overestimate the amount of sex other people are having. So that might be one avenue to maybe help incels realize that they're not uh, suffering as uniquely. Because one interesting finding mm -hmm. from COVID was that incel mental health, actually, there's some evidence to show that incel mental health got a little bit better during COVID because it was like, for them, they were thinking, well, everybody's <laughs> experiencing what I'm experiencing all the time now. So that was a, a kind of a paradoxical finding. Uh, the one positive of COVID. Yeah, right. And they're, they're kind of like cynical incels. So maybe they'd be like, oh, if I can't have any, I'm glad no one else can either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Feel better about other people suffering as well. Yeah. So a couple of other things we found about the incel kind of demographic, just to, the, the last few things there, uh, we investigated their socioeconomic status because, you know, we, we figured that socioeconomic status, there's a large body of evidence from evolutionary psychology that socioeconomic status matters a lot to women in the mating market. Uh, so we mm -hmm. wanted to investigate that. And we found that 50% of incels versus 27% of non-incels in our sample still live with a parent or carer. And you might say, oh, well, incels are just very young men, so they just haven't moved out. But the average age for incels in our study uh, was 27. So, uh, you know, you'd expect mm. perhaps they should have moved out by then. 17% uh, of incels compared to 9% of non-incels in our sample reported to be NEAT, which stands for not in education, employment or training. Uh, so they don't seem oh. to have much job prospects. And 36% of incels versus roughly 20% of non-incels have a high school education or lower. Uh, so on all those kind of okay. data points, they're a little bit uh, kind of being left behind. 
And another thing we wanted to investigate was the, um, in the media, incels are commonly, and even in this latest Olivia Wilde uh, article, uh, described <laughs> as kind of largely overwhelmingly white and white supremacist almost and far right. So we wanted to investigate the ethnicities and um, uh, political affiliations. And we found that 36% of incels were incels of color. And in a largely UK and US sample, that's actually overrepresentative. And uh, compared to all our participants of non incels and incels, we can analyze whether uh, it's actually more than you would expect by mere chance. And it, it, it was significantly more than you would expect by mere chance compared to the rest of the sample. In terms of their political affiliation, and I just asked one question in a, in a large study, I, I, and in my paper, I rec recommend that we investigate political beliefs a little bit more. But we found that roughly 39% reported that they're right leaning in their political affiliation, 45% reported to be left leaning, so more huh. left leaning, and 17% uh, said they were centrist. Um, other studies have found that just 3% of incel posts online could be considered racist. And meanwhile, 30% of incel threads in their forums could be considered misogynistic. Um, and that same study found that self hatred was by far the most common Aww. form of toxic language. So yeah, it's, it's, um, we're asked a, a lot of times um, to think about incels in terms of extremism. And it might be the case that extreme inceldom actually looks more like suicidality than oh. uh, extremism. Yeah, there's a, a high level of 82% of incels in uh, their own internal survey from the forums indicated that they had strongly considered suicide in their life, uh, which is kind of stark. And there's another really good study um, by Dr. Sarah Daly uh, called Goodbye My Friend Cells. And it documents kind of online rhetoric in the forums of suicidality and, you know, which is so prevalent in, in the inside. Oh my forums. gosh, that's horrible. And, yeah, she even highlights like some cases where maybe someone has wrote a last post and then they've never heard from again. And we don't know whether that person actually went on to commit suicide. It's kind of sad. Yeah. No, oh, that's that's really depressing. Mm -hmm. I think so. When when this Olivia Wilde thing happened with my dad, I, I called him and told him about it. You know, yeah. hero to the incels. Um, <clears throat> and his like, I didn't put everything he said online. I caught some of it and put it in a reaction video. But his main reaction was, "We should be, you know, trying to solve this problem," and feeling not feeling sorry for it exactly, but having compassion towards these people because it's actually like sad, you know, and you can't, you can't like as an incel, you wouldn't want to be angry and misogynistic and hateful. Um, but he said what he was working on was taking like lost men in particular and saying, Hey, you have the, the power to improve your life. And if you improve your life, then everything around you will improve, right. Including probably you being an incel, right. Because there are things you can do about it. Um, I would assume. I mean, that's depending on your situation. Yeah, that's uh, like it depends on what you mean by incel savior or incel god, even. So yeah. Savior might be actually more appropriate because his tough love, pick yourself up, build yourself up, tidy your room, develop yourself. Yeah, interesting. Might actually be what incels might need. But uh, in terms of, oh, incel uh, representative, he goes counter to the incel worldview. You know, his whole idea is. If every woman thinks this about you, they're right. Um, so, you know, that uh, what you said about it, your, your dad, his work often is about helping young men in particular, or everyone, uh, cultivate that internal locus of control, which our study shows that incels lack. Um, so, mm. You know, I, I'm even an example of one. Uh, when I started listening to your dad in like 2016 and 2017 uh, and started like applying some of his principles my life kind of trajectory uh, started to get a lot better and uh, I'm amazed at where it, it took me so I can totally that's the individual personal advice I would think that listening to Jordan Peterson's self-development advice would perhaps be good for incels but they hate that rhetoric they hate that idea of being told you need to develop you can yourself. do some yeah, yeah well that that's kind of interesting though because I feel like you can see that in a, in a lot of groups like um you know my backstory probably a little bit with the autoimmunity I had a mm -hmm. just horrible autoimmune disorder and when I was really sick I was in some of these groups for people with autoimmune disorders on Facebook 
Um, and it was mostly to like talk to other people to try and figure out how to get out of it, right? Like, hey, have you figured out a medication that works and all these things? Those groups are just like, that's just hell on earth, those groups. They're very depressing. Um, but when I finally figured out that there was a solution out of it for me anyway with diet, um, you can't communicate that into it. And I remember people coming to me when I was very sick saying like have you tried diet and i always took it as a slight and i think it was kind of condescending like oh you're doing something wrong and that's why you're in this situation and so that's not a good way to communicate something especially if you're trying to get somebody to change um but i do remember scoffing at people who told me oh you should exercise more you should diet um and being angry right at being angry about that so i can kind of understand like if someone's telling you, hey, if you did things, you could get out of the situation you're in, it's like, well, how dare you? You don't know how serious the situation I'm in is. Yeah, right? and that really much, very much applies to incels because it's kind of a, a wallowing in victimhood uh, ecosystem. So a lot of incels might even, if a, an individual incel reports having romantic success or having a date or something like that, the other incels might kick him out of the forum or say yeah. he's a fake cell and he wasn't ever really uh, struggling. And, he, you know, so he loses all that fraternity and friendship uh, as well. But yeah, that's your dad's message is you can only focus on the sovereignty of the individual. It's very unlikely that you can change the world around you sufficiently to, to make it so much better for you. But what you can control is how you behave, how you act in the world, whether you tilt the world towards heaven or hell in every day, make tomorrow better than yesterday. Like that, that is so much about the individual and uh, what you can change. But yeah, that's an antithetical to incels who say black pill thinking it's over. There was no point in trying. Uh, Jordan Peterson's mm -hmm. message would be, there's always hope and worth trying. You know, mm -hmm. that you can always affect change in your life. Is there overlap between the incel group and kind of the serious um i would i don't exactly know what even to call that group men's rights activism but that's not what it is it's it maybe it's called a black pill community online uh is that what it is manosphere yeah <laughs> is there like an overlap there or are yeah. those two separate things as well so i think incels are often kind of thrown in uh, whenever the manosphere is talked about in like uh on online articles or new media articles but the manosphere is a kind of a broad church um, and a lot of areas of the manosphere would probably sneer at incels and look down on them. So it's not like it's this collective sphere. It's um, there's different facets of it, like MGTOW, which is kind of like incels, but it stands for men going their own way. And that's where men who think that they probably could get sex or relationships, but think that it's worth not worth their trouble. So they're kind of going their own way and they would maybe differentiate themselves from incels. Um, and then there's red pill kind of communities, which is more like trying to, maybe the opposite of woke, uh, of trying to wake people up in another direction of this is how the mating market works. And uh, this, these are all the tricks you need to know and that kind of thing, pick up artists. It's a, a broad church, but I kind of think that there is, there needs to be maybe space for uh, foreign cells or for young men who are struggling, an ethical pickup artist culture. Because, yeah, OK, I, I yeah. can recognize that the pickup artist world has descended into maybe toxicity. And Andrew Tate might be an example of that in the, in the extremes. But that doesn't mean that there's not something worth salvaging there. And um, there's a lot of young men who are really struggling. And your dad makes a good point uh, when he, he was asked, um, why do you care about young men so much? Why, why, why does it matter if they're developed? And he says, well, women should care too. Don't they want competent partners? And that's yeah, a good yeah. point. It's yeah. like, you know, when, when one sex loses, the other sex loses too. Um, so I kind of, I haven't given up hope on ethical pickup artist kind of world. But it's funny because whenever you attach the goal of achieving romantic success uh, to self-development for men, it gets framed as misogynistic. And it's like, oh, you're being manipulative. Even Barack Obama, in his autobiography, yeah. he wrote um, about how he was reading different books to impress different types of women. And he got lambasted in the media for a, a short while saying, oh, that's so manipulative. And, you know, huh. for, for men listening, that's intuitive that, you know, get the goal, get the girl. 
that's kind of like yeah. an intuitive archetype for men always and ever. And, you know, your dad mentioned in this uh, uh, Olivia Wilde kind of fiasco in his original video that I kind of highlighted when he talked about how women are right. He talks about how female sexual selection is actually an engine of evolution more generally. And that it, the, the, the mind of one sex, the mind of the female actually shapes the body and the mind of the other sex. So whatever like yeah. females reward, men will go out and do. It's why men have strived maniacally for status and success um, for, you know, generations. Uh, so it's a, it's a real motivator. And I wouldn't uh, be so hasty to take it away from men. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's not to be That's trifled with. That's scary. That's so, so now... And now I suppose that's kind of ruled by women on birth control, right? Do you know what percentage of women are on birth control? Ooh, I don't, but I'd say it would be I can, increasing. I can look that up. Sure. But there's a really good book on birth control by um, my uh, a, a, a professor called Sarah Hill. And she was in the David Buss lab previously uh, to me. Um, and she wrote a book called This Is Your Brain on Birth Control. And it talks oh, about yeah. how... It's a really good book. Yeah. And um, so I direct your listeners to that one. She, she's an expert on too. that, not me. You should that's maybe have her one. on the show. She, she, she's great. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to write that down. That That's a really good idea. No, I'm, yeah. When I did some research into birth control, it's scary. And I remember being on birth control um, and my dad being who my dad is, uh, we were kind of oh, like, I knew these things like, oh, by the way, if you're taking birth control, you might prefer like more feminine men, like just that. And, and me being like, <clears throat> well, I'll just undo that in my head. Just like, I'll just be aware. <laughs> I Like as a 19 year old being like, I'll just like keep that in mind, like who I'm attracted to, like maybe go for the more masculine person to try, try and offset this birth control, which definitely doesn't work. It looks like 98% of sexually active women have used birth control wow. and 62, 62% of those of reproductive age are currently using birth control. So that means what men are doing in society or what they think is attractive is being dictated by women on birth control. That's scary. Yeah, it's certainly like bringing a bit more complexity to it anyway. And, you know, the hormones play a lot into mate choice and uh, sex, female sexuality. So, yeah, I think Sarah Hill would be a better expert than me, but it definitely, uh, you know, it's not having no effect. But, you know, what you mentioned there of, oh, I'll just override yeah, my yeah, preferences. Yeah. Uh, I remember actually being in the audience for one of your dad's talks in like 2018, maybe, or 20, 2017. And uh, he gave us all a good classic Jordan Peterson finger wagging. And he told us that he goes, you have no idea why you want what you want. And I thought it always resonated with me because a lot of what the brain does and a lot of our preferences is kind of cryptic to us. We don't actually know. Yeah. So the idea that, you know, you just can control your mate preferences and, you know, even things like olfactory cues, like your sense of scent, you might really be attracted to someone and then you get close to them and you sniff them and, oh, whoa, no, actually the attraction isn't there. Uh, so it's all very cryptic. So the idea of like a, a hormonal birth control not having any effect seems strange to me. Very, very unlikely. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what do you think of this recent craze over Andrew Tate? Just like blowing up. Yeah, I'm not that familiar with him either. I've found any kind of time I've tried to look into him, I've found a lot of his stuff seems a bit too unsavory for me. I think I think I saw a quote where he said that women are barely sentient, but it kind of like uh, it points to this idea if if you leave a vacuum of no real male role models to kind of uh, emulate and striving for success and achieving romantic success someone will fill that vacuum and you might not like what they're like. Um, so, you know, I feel like there's a space there to be filled and we can maybe do a bit better than, than Andrew Tate, but I, I'm not that familiar with him. I wonder how many of his clips that went viral were also taken out of context. I mean, some of the things he said are harsh, like mm. taken out of context, they're harsh, but I wonder, yeah. I'm so skeptical. I'm so skeptical of things online after seeing like sound bites of my dad being like, yeah, well, if you only cut that two and a half seconds, then I guess it doesn't sound great. But yeah, yeah, I've, I've certainly seen that. that with your dad, but I don't know what preceding context could be given to no. women are barely sentient. <laughs> I don't, no, that's, that's not, that's not a bit beyond the pale for me. That, but, that's, yeah, that's, I'm not that familiar. That's not ideal. Um, 
Interesting. Okay, the socially enforced monogamy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Tell tell me about that. So your dad got in trouble for using this phrase, and it actually points to a wide, broadly understood kind of concept in mating literature. So basically, what happens is that monogamy is socially enforced. You know, it's not um, we enforce it through norms. If someone cheats, we think that's bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, the common norm is. To be monogamous that's certainly culturally enforced there's nothing controversial there but what your dad was suggesting that it might be a a, a solution to the incel problem or to the surplus population of unpartnered young men is actually also true so there's really a, a good paper called the puzzle of monogamous marriage by a, a psychologist called joseph henrik brilliant paper that talks about how monogamy evolved as a cultural norm because 83% of human societies uh, ever studied have been preferentially polygynous, meaning one man with multiple female partners. What? And that's right. Wait, yeah, that's say right. that again. What's the percentage? 83 plus. So, and when I say preferentially polygynous, that doesn't mean that everybody in that society would have multiple wives. You would have some with multiple wives and many men disenfranchised having none, right? So the most high status men in those societies oh. might have one or two wives. But it, it got a little bit imbalanced. And what happened then was when you had the advent of agriculture about 10,000 years ago, uh, you had, for the first time, you had the ability to stockpile resources. So those men at the top were able to attract such inequality in terms of their resources that they mm. were able to attract hundreds of wives or way more wives. So what happened then was the culturally evolved norm, those cultures that had a norm of practicing monogamy, basically flourished and those that practiced polygyny didn't because if you okay basically the main cultural advantage of the monogamy is the more egalitarian distribution of women so if you reduce those surplus population of unpartnered young men they're not out there committing young male syndrome they're not um, committing crime there and they can actually focus on uh, helping their family and helping their community and those cultures then thrive. So that's a, a widely understood concept in the literature. So I think it was, a, yeah, just very taken out of context or willfully uh, misconstrued to, to paint them in a bad light. Yeah, interesting. Mm. I like the idea of an ethical pickup artist. Mm, Although yeah. I suppose, I mean, I wouldn't want to put my dad in that category exactly, <laughs> but, but like he does try and teach people, particularly men, but not just men, how to improve themselves in order to have monogamous relationships. So I guess maybe I'll tell him that later. Yeah. Ethical well, pickup artist, dad. If, if he ever wants to go into business, <laughs> I'm available. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. When did, um, originally, are, are you that familiar with the kind of pickup artist background? Like I, I remember, I think it was, it was something like 2011 or 2010. There was one guy, I think he was in Canada. I can't remember that kind of went viral starting with an R, Rush or something? Mm, I that, vaguely okay. familiar. That, that I remember was... reading Neil Strauss, The Game, when I was a teenager and listening to yeah. Tucker Max and all that. So, yeah. Okay, okay, and Tucker Max. Um, wh when did it go from, was it always kind of viewed in a negative light? Or was it okay to begin with and then somehow it just declined into toxicity? I mean, maybe looking back through the rearview mirror, you can maybe see some of the toxic elements to it, kind of gamifying the system. But I mean, you know, all mating is you could conceptualize it as a bit of a game. There are rules, there are yeah. tax strategies that work better and don't work and you know, things you can learn about it. Uh, but it just maybe over gamified the whole thing and dehumanized the thing a bit more. But it's, it's funny because yeah. whenever I talk about uh, online, when I use uh, psychological literature terminology like make value and uh, make preferences some people like extreme leftists maybe come on and say uh, there's no such thing as make value and this sexual economics theory of uh, an economic kind of trade-off in the mating market in the mating market it's all so ugly it's it doesn't work like that and i would just like to say to those people how do you make your mating decisions just <laughs> completely arbitrarily just I'll pick whoever I happen to pick. Of course you have rules and what those rules are might change and you might reward different things and we can talk about whether those are good, bad, whatever, but there are some rules. There's always, a, it's a, you know, it is an amazing market. People compete in it and are selected from it. 
So it's an absolutely amazing market and uh, yeah. people have different value in that for various different reasons. Yeah. Yeah. That, that could go badly too. Cause then you could say, okay, well, wearing makeup, making yourself look good as a woman, making yourself look good. Okay. That's, that's got to play a role. And then you could delve even deeper and be like, well, what if men who work out in order to look better, is that manipulative? It's like, right. n- n- may- well, maybe I guess, but then is everything manipulative? And if everything is, then maybe none of it is. It's hard yeah. to say. I mean, like there's a really good paper by my former supervisor, Andrew Thomas. Uh, I think it's called the ape that thought it was a peacock. And it highlights how uh-uh. evolutionary psychology uh, used to maybe have the dominant theory of uh, males compete, females choose. And it talks about how females are the sexual selectors and males compete. But if that was true, then females, the human female, would be drab and completely unarmed, yeah. not ornate, never do themselves up and just go to the nightclub in their pajamas and just select the whatever man they want. Like, look at a peacock. It's so much, it's so bright and colorful compared to the drab pea hen. Uh, but in humans, that's not the case. So he developed a new theory of a mutual mate choice. So females compete perhaps just as aggressively for male selection uh, as female, uh, as fem- men do for female selection. M- maybe not as much, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I can see that. I mean, being a female in high school is rough, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I think it's rough for everybody. Women can be unbelievably mean to each other. Yeah, and it's usually around kind of ma- uh, whenever either sex insults each other, um, when men insult other men and women insult other women, it's usually to do with mating relevant information. So women say, oh, you slut, or she's easy. She's a, it kind of lowering her value there. Whereas men might say, oh, well, he's a sissy. Or he's a, not a real man. And it's kind of lowering uh, what's valuable to the other sex in the mating domain. It's, all, oh, it's, always, it's always relevant to mating, everything. That is so cool. Mm. That's so fun. I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'm going to let you go. Sure. You said hypergamy, so marrying up might be in decline. Is that true? And why would that be true? I mean, th- there's evidence to show that. Um, and I, my opinion, what, that's... What's the, what's the evidence to show that? So uh, there's a paper called The Decline of Hypergamy, I believe. I'm just trying to pull it up. Uh, <laughs> Aptly named. Yeah. Um, so it's just, I think it's inevitable because when more and more women are earning more than men and higher educated, if their choice is to be single or to mate down, I think a lot of them will choose to mate down or certainly more and more of them. Right. You know, that that trend doesn't seem that uh, that seems intuitive to me, but it's what happens alongside that. So I mentioned the internet partner violence as one unfortunate oh, finding yeah. alongside that, but also there's some evidence and uh, my supervisor and I maybe disagree on how much to trust this evidence. He's more um, uh, cynical than me on this uh, line of evidence, but there's some evidence that the decline in hypergamy uh, happens in lockstep with increases in rates of female infidelity. So rates of infidelity for men have remained pretty stable over time, but they've increased by 40% among women in the last half century. So women specifically. And that makes a bit of sense if you think, well, women now have anonymity of dating apps, maybe they're surrounded by more high status men. They're not as financially Mm -hmm. dependent, but um, I'd be, I'd share my supervisor's cynicism that the gap of male infidelity versus female infidelity will totally close. I think, you know, even with this massive increase, women still only, if if we took that as uh, real, uh, women would still only commit infidelity 70% as much as men. So it's so, still, still <laughs> even still. with a huge increase for women, men are still bigger dogs. <laughs> do, you, do, you think, do you think that increase could be caused by less respect as well? Well, less respect or just less reliance. You know, you're around more high status yeah. men. And even just proximity breeds intimacy. Uh, a lot anyway so you're, you mm. kind of tend to fall in love with the people you're around a lot and workplace romances happened a lot in our history and they're kind of frowned upon completely now which is a, how a lot of people tended to meet in the past and uh, it, it, yeah. that, that's kind of a, a dodgy one because that idea of proximity breeds intimacy is true so people are going to develop feelings with their colleagues or their classmates and things like that but it's kind of fraught territory now um, so yeah, that's going on. 
the less reliance on their men. So traditionally, maybe women couldn't afford to have an affair because it would perhaps yeah. inflict such a cost. You know, you might if, if you're left or whatever, you might not uh, have the financial resources to manage on your own, things like that. So all, all of that's kind of coming into play. Do you think this uh, increase in interpersonal violence um, amongst couples that where the woman out earns the man, mm -hmm. do you think that could also be kind of a because of frustration or another way to assert dominance like obviously not a good way but being like okay well i'm not dominant in the in the money area i'll be dominant in the physical strength area yeah that's exactly right because it, in evolutionary psychology we have mate retention and you have ta two tactics for mate retention you can benefit provide you can be a, a provision benefit so those who have a lot of benefit to provide will choose that strategy yeah. whereas if you don't have a lot of benefit to provide you'll cost inflict, you'll apply cost inflicting mate retention strategies. So you'll make it so hard for the woman to leave. And that's what like abusive partners do. They just make it uh, so hard. And, you know, even stalking, for example, which is a overwhelmingly male pattern of behavior. And um, that's most often done by an ex partner. And the idea is that it makes it so difficult for the woman to move on with her life. And it actually, one of disturbing findings from uh, Dr. Buss's lab is that stalking works. And a, an unfortunate finding is that women who are stalked often go back to their partner. And precisely because the man is just making it so costly, uh, you know, for another future mate, yeah. who's going to get involved with a woman who her ex is going to be always around the house and going to beat you up or maybe kill you? You know, <laughs> and if you think about ancestrally, that would have really worked. Now you might land yourself in prison and things like that, but being a stalker in our ancestral environment might have really worked because, you know, it was a bit more lawless. <clears throat> Interesting. So mm. that's how that tactic works. Yeah. And certainly, so for men who are oh. getting the cue that their partner is around other high status men, not as reliant on them, doesn't really need them. They're kind of thinking, oh, uh, I might... I'm getting desperate. And it's, it's when a man feels like he's about to lose a partner, that's when he gets violent and dangerous. So it, it's a, it's not, it's, it's something worth thinking about. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I feel like that happens more than we think it does. Yeah, certainly. And I think people who work in like social work will maybe recognize that when and they might frame it as precarious masculinity, when a man doesn't feel like a man, well, what perhaps is going to make a man not feel like a man, a lot is his partner earning more than them or, you know, he, him not having access to status um, mm. you know, masculinity is kind of demeaned culturally a little bit too. So, and you know, so. Okay. A, okay. A, unfortunate. Here's a good question then. Here's, here's my last question. Uh, are there ways around this? Say that you're with somebody and the females out earning the male, which is bound to happen. Are there ways that you can kind of assert dominance as a man without just beating your significant other or re resorting to stalking right have so, you heard uh, of any like tricks uh, so i would like say that yeah you, you can create any amount of status domains now so okay your man might not be the best um high status in his workplace but he could be high status in your dance club that you go to or in your art or whatever it might be and um, then it, it, it's kind of a pathway for both to see each other for, for, for each partner to see him in a high status kind of light and um, as long as the man feels maybe seen as high status in some to some degree and I, I can just imagine a lot of listeners being like oh the weak-minded man needs to be seen as important well yeah <laughs> and but for the woman too though like in, course, a, in a relationship prefers to it prefers yeah. to admire her partner so find some avenue to do that it could be Sexually, it could be socially, it could be sport, it could be dance, art, whatever it might be. But unfortunately, a lot of men's hobbies now tends to be computer games, right? And oh, I don't yeah. think women are that it's not interested. Ideal. <laughs> right, not, <laughs> not, not, not perhaps great. not the sexiest. Um, so that's uh, another cultural phenomenon that's maybe driving the sexes against each other wow. a little bit. Yeah, I, I don't think there's many, uh, maybe I'm wrong, there might be... Um, fandom of women who are interested in computer gamers and stuff like that but i don't think mm. it's quite typical <clears throat> i don't think i don't think it's quite typical either mm -hmm. that's sneaky though just find a different area to kind of play a dominance game there right you can create any status yeah. okay i like mm. it okay william 
Uh, that was very interesting. Thank you. If people want to follow you online or learn more about this, are there things they should read or social media handles you have? Sure. So our first paper from my master's dissertation on in-cell psychology, some of the findings that I talked about today is coming out soon. It's currently in press at the journal Evolutionary Psychological Science. Cool. And uh, to keep an eye on me, uh, I spend far too much time on Twitter. So my handle is at Costello William. And uh, yeah, you'll, you'll keep uh, you'll have an idea of everything I'm up to by following me on there. OK, cool, cool. Well, send me over that when it's published. Sure. I'll link it in the video. Great. That's very yeah. cool. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. First publication. So I'm uh, over the moon with that one. Wow. Okay. Okay. Thank you again. Thanks, Michaela. Bye-bye.